from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. I am most pleased to welcome you to part two of a three-part series entitled An Asian Album and Journey. Uh, on today's program, we're going to talk about India again, as we did last week, but a different part of India. Our guests call this the Vibrant South. As I introduce uh, part two, I want to remind you that we'll be with you next week in the final se uh, segment, and I shall talk to you at the end of the program about what that is. But I am just filled with enthusiasm and uh, energy and excitement and, and pride uh, with my colleagues uh, who have done this series for us and have traveled on sabbatical to Asia uh, and have brought back so much. Uh, welcome to the program. Again, my colleagues, Judy Sildi from the History Department at North Idaho College, and next to her is Jim McLeod from the English Department. And these two persons have given so much to this institution for a very long time, and, and when they go on trips and sabbaticals, they only, they only bring back uh, this wonderful information to an audience on campus on the Popcorn Forum and, and on this TV program, but it is cataloged for you in the future and also for classes at North Idaho College. And uh, Judy and Jim, thank you for sharing so much. And I want to tell our audience that you also, with many, many hours of work, put together three 50-minute videos uh, about uh, your study, and those are located in the North Idaho College Library, and people can come here and enjoy those that have even more depth than we have time for here. And again, congratulations to you, and most of all, a really big thank you. Oh, you're most That's welcome, fine. Tony. And as always, I'm so pleased to have Janelle Burke, who is a regular panelist and attorney in the state of Idaho. And as we move into the vibrant south of India, we shall ask Janelle to commence today's questioning after we do one other thing that uh, Judy Silly is going to do that's very special. Uh, I know our viewers like slides, and you're going to run us through a, a series of slides from this particular part of your trip. And Judy will ask you to introduce that and do that at this time. Okay, sure. Well, again, we just have a little sampler for you. Obviously, we could show you thousands if time permitted, um, but here, this will give you just a little bit of an idea uh, of what the South looks like. Jim and I had no idea what to expect when we traveled there ourselves, uh, but we found that it was beautiful and, in fact, our most uh, favorite part of the entire trip. Uh, leaving India's huge northern cities and western desert behind, we headed for tropical South India and the neighboring island of Sri Lanka. We had both a personal and scholarly interest in the 18th century British era in India, as General Norman MacLeod, Jim's Scottish ancestor, was British commander-in-chief there on the Malabar coast, which is the southwestern coast of India. Uh, this was during the wars with Tipu, the colorful sultan who ruled much of India south at the time. Southern India is a place of splendid monuments, such as Mysore Palace, illuminated at night like a fairy land. But uh, there's more to India than just the monuments. In fact, we enjoyed most of all, I think, our time in quiet rural villages such as this one, filled with friendly people. And we think of this as the real India, the India you don't hear as much about in the tourist material. The designs in front of this mother and her children are prayers to the Hindu mother goddess painted daily in front of each home. And again, one of the aspects of Hinduism that we found very interesting. This friendly Brahmin priest who insisted that I take his photo also helped give Hinduism a more human face for us. And we visited many very beautiful Hindu temples filled with art and an incredible variety of worship activities, unimaginable, really. Um, two of Hinduism's most popular deities are Krishna, whose many adventures lend the religion a very down-to-earth touch. He's perhaps the most popular of all the Hindu gods. And the majestic and very complex god Shiva, or Lord of the Dance, who is a destroyer, but one who destroys everything in order to begin life anew. Hinduism is a complex and fascinating faith, and one we enjoyed learning about. India is rich in performing arts, such as Kadikali, a very ancient form of dance drama that's like nothing we've ever seen here in Coeur d'Alene. The backwaters of Kerala state are one of the most scenic parts of India, where quiet canals and lagoons take the place of roads. 
and the coast of South India, in fact, is lined with magnificent beaches, such as this one at Kovalam, which are almost deserted. Uh, it's just an incredibly beautiful part of the world. Our first stop in neighboring Sri Lanka was Colombo, the colonial era capital of what used to be called Ceylon, uh, filled with lots of historical buildings. And it was there in Colombo that we watched an astonishing two-hour Buddhist procession called the Parahara, uh, which was quite unforgettable. I wish I could show you slides of everything we saw there. Much of the world's Buddhism spread originally from Sri Lanka, and two of the commonest sites in the whole country are Buddhist monks, such as these young novices, and elephants, which we enjoyed visiting, especially at a government elephant orphanage. This is the 5th century palace of Siguria, which is perched on a 600-foot rock pinnacle looming above the jungle, one of many fascinating ancient monuments that dot the country. The central highlands reminded us of Scotland or Norway. Here, the finest tea in the world is grown, as you may know. And uh, in contrast to that, the coasts are lined with I think the most beautiful beaches that Jim and I have ever been to. Uh, Sri Lanka as a whole is richly blessed by nature in almost every way. And we'll end with my most vivid memory of Sri Lanka, the beautiful ancient shrine called the Galvihara at Palanaruva, whose tranquility perfectly captures for me uh, the essence of Buddhism and I think of Sri Lankan culture. That was just breathtaking and I know our viewers appreciate that so much and I'll ask Janelle to open up the questioning. You talked a great deal uh, as we were watching the slides about how you learned about various things and what kinds of languages did you speak and what kinds <laughs> of languages did the people speak? I know that there are a great number of languages. Perhaps Jim would like to start by telling us something about that. You're an English instructor. Perhaps you could tell us something about the various languages that you found there. Well, uh, certainly, Janelle. Um, as you, as some of the viewers may remember from last week, we spoke about this. Uh, most of the people we ran into did speak English, but uh, it was in various uh, degrees of clarity as far as we were concerned. So um, there are a number, great number of languages, of course, in India, and there are, of course, several in uh, Sri Lanka as well. And, uh, but we found that we were able to communicate uh, quite easily, um, to our surprise. Uh, if we couldn't do it by uh, word, then we, of course, used hand signals and all the other things that you learn as a tourist to use. Let me just add, there are, in India, there are 15 official languages. There are 1,680 different dialects spoken. And purely in terms of the alphabet, there are 13 different alphabets. So you often find, just in going from one state to another, um, the language entirely changes, including its look on signs. And so we, frankly, just totally <laughs> gave up uh, on trying to, to, to even speak phrases of most of those languages. That would take a great deal of study. <laughs> what kinds of newspapers and how are they use, getting their news around? Were they using newspapers? Or were there local newspapers as well as an, uh, perhaps a national kind of newspaper? Uh, or did you see village newspapers that would be informing people about what was going on locally? How do they get their news around? Well, in India, uh, they, when we were in Delhi, of course, we, s we had access to a number of newspapers there, and uh, they're pretty much in the British mold, British tradition. Um, the uh, language in the paper uh, is somewhat uh, archaic, and, and sometimes you had a little trouble finding uh, uh, I think Judy could think of a few examples of this, uh, uh, interpreting exactly what they meant with somebody absconding from a crime, for example. We would say someone was uh, uh, fleeing or something of that sort, but they used the word, the term absconding, which was uh, rather uh, unusual to us. Uh, we didn't encounter a lot of uh, that sort of thing in villages at all. And, uh, and, and I uh, must confess, I don't recall reading the paper in Colombo, but I probably did in Sri Lanka. But, uh, uh, I don't remember it uh, right offhand. We did run into an occasional USA Today, which was uh, welcomed so we could at least keep track of what was going on uh, back home and uh, in the rest of the world. But uh, we were, uh, one of the things, that the impressions I had, of course, was that how much of um, India is focused on things that are happening in India and there are just little bits and pieces of things in their papers about our world, whereas it's the reverse in our country. We are all focused on our uh, various things in our country, and we have just little bits and pieces of things about India in the paper. And so it's a complete reversal, and uh, 
I found that uh, quite interesting. I, I must confess that I got quite addicted to reading Indian newspapers. There are an incredible variety of them. Actually, India has, I believe, it's the world's third largest publishing industry, uh, which is kind of surprising. Um, the printed word is alive and well in India in some ways more than it is in this country. And I was delighted to discover when I got back home that one of India's leading newspapers is on the Internet daily, so I can still keep up with events there in India from my own study at home, and that, that's great. I've actually been doing that quite a bit. <laughs> well, there's been a great division in India, and Judy and Jim, I know you discovered this. If we go back to Gandhi, uh, there w there's religious division, and Gandhi had a, a great difficulty trying to, but uh, great success, and of course, leading them to independence. And at one point, he even went um, on a s hunger strike to, to bring people together in, in his nonviolence. But now we see that um, even though it's an independent country and lots going on, that there is conflict and there has been an a, a, a internal strife going on. Judy, I'll start with you and would you bring us up to date because it wasn't very long ago that you were there and tell us what is happening and what you both perceive to be the outcome. Sure. Uh, well, the first thing I should say on a positive note is that one of the reasons Jim and I enjoyed southern India so much is that there's relatively little of the sectarian conflict that you're talking about. Uh, there's a very long tradition there of the various religions coexisting. It has one of the world's oldest Jewish communities founded in 586 B.C., if you can imagine that. Um, one of the oldest Christian churches in the world founded uh, by Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples. Um, Islam was there within a generation of Muhammad's death and, of course, Hinduism. Uh, is perhaps its most traditional there in the South. And they all get along beautifully, so it certainly can be done. India has a very long tradition of tolerance. But one of the things which disturbed me most deeply was seeing the increasing tendency toward uh, not just sectarian prejudice, but in fact all kinds of sectarian violence in northern India in particular. I was uh, dismayed and remain dismayed by the tremendous popularity of a political party called the BJP, which is essentially an ultra-nationalist Hindu uh, party. I would, would consider it very extremist. Uh, was not taken very seriously when it first came on the scene a few years ago, but uh, is predicted now to win the next national elections. During the time that we were there, they won all but one of the statewide elections that they ran in. And they have largely come to the public's attention by taking quite extreme positions, urging uh, mobs to go out on Hindu holidays and tear down Muslim shrines. Um, and various things like that, passing legislation forbidding Muslims from moving to the city of Bombay uh, and so on. So I find all of that um, quite alarming. I don't have a crystal ball, but I certainly consider it one of the most serious problems that India faces. Uh, it's not a new problem. Remember that Gandhi mm -hmm. was associated mm -hmm. by a Hindu fanatic himself, so I have confidence they can deal with it. Uh, but I think we're in for a rocky spell. And it's really far into what Gandhi was trying to do. It's exactly the opposite of, and one of the things that's surprising is although Gandhi is considered sort of the father of the country, uh, many of these Hindu extremists um, really castigate him and think that he uh, did a lot of very bad things uh, for India by sort of selling out on his Hindu heritage. So uh, as we know, um, that sort of extremist thinking we have here uh, at home too, and it's, it seems to be a human problem and not just a local problem in India or anywhere else. I would just add one more thing. Uh, the, when we were in Rajasthan, we were traveling in an area with a Maharaja um, who spoke to us about the situation, political situation in India. It was his feeling that India was on the verge of disintegration because of all the various uh, nationalities and states and cultures and languages and so on that to keep this country together, to keep it uh, functioning, was going to be uh, a superhuman task and that uh, the likelihood that India could go into the next uh, millennium, uh, or sorry, the next century uh, intact, w he doubted very, very uh, sincerely. It's also, I think, explains a little bit about Kashmir and why the Indians uh, refused to let Kashmir have a plebiscite and to have it uh, probably go into e either its own uh, uh, its own state or, or join Pakistan is because uh, they're afraid if, if Kashmir does this, the whole country is going to come unglued. 
And of course, mm -hmm. this is just one man's view, but we heard this in other places in India too, the fear that, that India uh, as a state, as a nation, uh, might not uh, continue. Uh, well, there's some as evidence it is. Uh, in Eastern Europe what's happening yes. there. Yes, the, mm -hmm. the very much the same kind of thing. On the other hand, we should say that some people predicted India wouldn't last a year when it was uh, founded in 1947. And True. in fact, I think it's extraordinary what they've accomplished. It is the world's biggest democracy fighting, you know, incredible odds. Well, close to a billion people. Now. Yes, exactly. Yes. Very close to a billion. Within a couple of years, it will be over a billion people. I have another question before going back to Janelle. Uh, since we talked about this program being about the southern part of India, and the you know, key word you used was vibrant south, uh, give us a little comparison, contrast between uh, southern India and northern India and how it's different. It's like in our country, you know, if someone's talking about going out west or back east, how there's great differences geographically and economically and so forth. Jim, would you? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll start, and I think Judy would probably have something to add to this, but. Uh, for me, uh, I think there's, uh, the people are much friendlier, uh, much more open. Um, the uh, ceremonies and religious activities, uh, et cetera, festivals are um, seemingly, to me anyway, much more uh, present and visible. Uh, the women dress in very bright colors and uh, the scenery, of course, is uh, much more appealing to me, the uh, tropical scenery and uh, with all the flowers and greenery and and so on. Uh, I, I've always had this notion in my mind, which uh, changed very ra readily uh, when I visited India, that, that uh, India was rather um, uh, semi-desert and uh, there wasn't much of anything uh, uh, of this sort there, but uh, I, I was totally wrong about this and I, I feel uh, grateful that I had an opportunity to <laughs> sort of change some of these misconceptions that I had about the country. Did you, did you react much the same way? Yeah, very much so. As I said earlier, it was definitely our favorite part of India, and I can't understand why so many uh, travelogues and so on scarcely show that part of it, because in terms of physical beauty and truly the, the people, uh, we met many fine people in northern India too, but uh, just the general level of civility, um, I incredible warmth and hospitality to us. Um, it was just much higher in southern India. So if I were going to India with only, say, two weeks to spend, I probably wouldn't even bother with the north. I would spend it all in the south, and that's quite contrary to the popular wisdom on the subject. <laughs> and for our new viewers that weren't with us last week, uh, you, were, you had a very extended stay, so you had time to go to many yeah, places. Yeah, we were there about two months in all. Yeah. So, Janelle Burke. Well, the, the country of India is divided up into states, and so can we talk a little bit about how the government is, is formed, and perhaps, Judy, that would be a good to start with you, uh, to talk a little bit about how the government is formed for the sake of our viewers so that they understand uh, how the, the, the country of India actually is broken up. Okay, sure. Uh, it's essentially um, a federal system, much like um, the United States or Canada's. Um, each state has its own government. There are tremendous differences from one state uh, to the other. Um, for instance, Jim and I became quite fascinated with the state politics of Tamil Nadu, which is one of the largest uh, southern states. They have a rather interesting tradition there. All of their leading politicians uh, have been for some time former movie stars. And uh, <laughs> uh, Mrs. Jayalitha, who is their chief minister or governor, as we would call her, um, was a leading lady for a long time on screen, and she's quite a remarkable uh, woman who is perceived by many of the villagers as, you know, superhuman, as virtually uh, a goddess. And uh, she does everything she can to encourage this perception, <laughs> and it is quite infamous uh, for it in other parts of India. So one of the things Jim and I found uh, extraordinary as we drove through Tamil Nadu is that on many of the leading uh, intersections all through the state, you find 30-foot uh, <laughs> towering cardboard stand-up figures of Mrs. Jayalitha, and as if that's not funny enough, she's dressed always either as the Virgin Mary or as Parvati, you know, the great mother goddess of Hinduism, uh, etc. And we really got the giggle saying, could you imagine if uh, if Bill Clinton or, uh, you know, Governor Bad or somebody like that erected 30-foot statues of themselves. <laughs> um, but it seems to work. She's very popular there. <laughs> well, what is going on in Sri Lanka right now? Um, is there discord and disharmony in that beautiful state? 
Yes, uh, we uh, were very fortunate, Janelle, to have uh, a window of opportunity to visit Sri Lanka uh, and uh, not have a problem with this. But they have been having a civil war, a, a very serious civil war, for a number of years now. And coincidentally, as soon as we left, uh, the war resumed. Now, <laughs> I don't think there was any connection between <laughs> our departure and the war uh, resuming, but. Uh, Certainly, uh, we are very concerned about what's happened there, and uh, it's such a beautiful country, uh, one, of the, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, and uh, this, to see the people um, having this kind of uh, unrest and uh, combat and so forth in what, what is essentially a paradise, uh, y it's hard to understand, it's hard to uh, grasp that. Uh, but uh, it is uh, definitely a very serious uh, situation, and. Uh, I don't know uh, how it's going to be resolved in any long-term way. The uh, issue there is the same one that's bedeviling India. It's an ethnic uh, issue, and the Tamil, <coughs> excuse me, the Tamil minority um, are really insisting on, at the very least, more independence for themselves, if not outright independence. And they feel so strongly about it that it was a Tamil extremist who assassinated. Uh, Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi just a few years ago. So, um, as we've said before, these issues of nationalism and ethnicity are extremely complex in that part of the world. Something else that, that you did when you did your video production that I mentioned that's 50 minutes long, and I got to view all three of those, <coughs> I was really touched with your compassion for the, the conditions that some people have to live in and the, and the poor. and and I want, and I know it's in, in all different parts of India that some people are in this situation, like the South we're talking about today. And Judy, I would start with you and ask you to, to share some of those thoughts with the viewers and how it affected you. And I remember one of the comments in your video was that how very fortunate uh, you realized you were as you saw the conditions and, and, and how the human race has not responded to some of those conditions. Yes, well, it's definitely the hardest part of travel in India, I think. Um, I don't mean that in a complaining way, but I just felt so overwhelmed sometimes with the extent of human need and human misery, and particularly overwhelmed with the realization that even if uh, Jim and I gave away you know, our entire month's salary, we would not make uh, a ripple in the ocean of human misery there. Um, there is so much of it. and. I guess what I would like to say is I think that's pretty well known. As a matter of fact, I think it's very bothersome to Indians that so often uh, when you say the word India to people in other parts of the world, poverty is about the only thing that comes to mind. Uh, it's for good reason because there is tremendous poverty. But what I was more impressed by than the poverty, I think, was the resilience of the human spirit in dealing with adversity that I think we Americans uh, really cannot imagine. Uh, when you think that in the big cities of India, uh, a third of the people are living on the streets. Uh, even those who don't live on the streets are living in tents or, you know, substandard uh, housing, etc. And yet, the images that I carry with me most strongly, and I wish that I could show them to you uh, here on video, are. Um, some of the people we met who have transcended that kind of hardship uh, in a way that I just find uh, magnificent. For instance, um, a leper uh, who Jim and I met the very first morning that we arrived in Delhi, and uh, he has only stumps uh, for hands. He had fresh sores on his hands and legs. He had the most radiant smile I have ever seen anywhere. Uh, I gave him roughly 35 cents worth of rupees that first day, and he, you know, thought that was tremendous. And, the, and so I began looking for him each day to give him a little more. And uh, when we left, and I gave him um, three or four dollars worth, you know, you would have thought that I had given him uh, a, a million dollars. He was so thrilled. He was hoping to buy a blanket with it. And as I say, the the smile on his face and that ability to to rise above things, which I think we Americans think of as catastrophic, surely has lessons uh, for all of us. It gives you a different <laughs> perspective. Oh, tremendous. Jim, would you like to add? Uh, you were witnessing all of this too. Well, it's uh, very heart rending and uh, rending, and it's uh, a situation where uh, you know if you want to look at that, and that's the only thing you look at when you're in India 
then you could come away um, very, very uh, despairing about the situation. Uh, I, I like to look at some of the things that India is trying to do. Uh, I just received yesterday a letter from an Islamic scholar that we met in Mysore, uh, Dr. B. Sheikh Ali, who uh, is a former uh, chancellor of Mysore University. And he's retired now, but he started a school to help the poor in Mysore. And what he's doing is teaching them or having um, them learn skills that will get them into uh, some kind of employment that they can make their way in the world. And uh, I thought this was a wonderful thing. Here's a man who's a, an academic, uh, widely respected, uh, who is uh, taking time to work with the people who are obviously not of his social class, etc and showing a real compassion and concern for those people. And I think that's uh, the, the, the th sort of thing that I'd like to focus on and, and think is possible. Um, certainly, if, if there are people out there who would like to uh, find uh, some way to make a contribution or to help situations, we know of many schools and places like this that could use you know, uh, something just to help them along. We'd be happy to receive letters or whatever from, no, from your places. audience. Sure. Janelle mm -hmm. Burke. One of the things that we might talk about, and I know we have a very brief amount of time left, is what, what does the average Indian in South India do? What, what kinds of, of uh, what ways do they make livings? Are, are they agricultural mainly? Yeah, most Indians are farmers. That still accounts for about three quarters of um, you know, the income in India. Uh, they're very small farmers. Probably the average farm is uh, an acre or, or two, um, but you find all kinds of that, uh, kinds of manufacture that we don't have here. The coconut husk or coconut husk fiber industry is a big one, uh, etc. Not a lot of uh, heavy industry in the South, which is probably why we liked it. <laughs> and Jim, what do the Indians eat? Well, in uh, South Africa, <laughs> or they eat India. rice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Judy, of course, uh, had some problems uh, with with her diet at one point, and uh, rice is no longer something that she particularly <laughs> I, enjoys. I but that, yes. I could eat that forever. And I, uh, I I've just been uh, notified that we're out of time. But the viewers who are uh, hanging on this and other <laughs> issues, uh, the good news is that our guests uh, Judith Sildy and Jim McLeod will be back with us again next week for part three. And in that program, we're going to look at some of the things, such as the cities and the peaks and the jungles in India. And we're going to go to Nepal and, and also some discussion of Singapore and Hong Kong. And I would like to invite all of you to be with us again when we do this third program with uh, our wonderful guests who are uh, my colleagues at North Idaho College who had an extensive trip to Asia. Until then, uh, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.